Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning, a your channel for all things magic. In our video for today, we are going to update and upgrade our Will Health the Rot Cleaver EDH deck, one of the many commander decks currently residing in the Burgeoning Commander Catalog. Greetings and salutations to the MTGBC. You are the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome back to another installment of the Up and Up series. Today, it's time to update and upgrade Will Health the Rot Cleaver. This is just one of the many EDH decks that currently reside in the Burgeoning Commander Catalog. You can access this by clicking on the playlist on MTG Burgeoning's YouTube page. In addition to that, down in the description, you can click the link to tappedout.net where you can see the updated deck list of this build as it stands right now. So for today, we've got a number of cards that are going to go in to help synergize exactly what we're trying to do in this zombie tribal build. And the first is, shockingly enough, a zombie. Going into the 99 of this Will Health build, it is Poxwalkers. Here we have a 3-1 zombie with death touch for two and a black mana straight from the Warhammer 40k commander decks. And whenever we cast a spell from anywhere other than our hand, we may return Poxwalkers from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So initially, I know what you're thinking, that the only way we're going to be able to get Poxwalkers out of our graveyard is whenever we cast Wilhelt from the command zone. Well, it's time to start opening up your mind to greater possibilities. In the 99 of this build, we have numerous ways in which to cast spells from our graveyard and get Poxwalkers back from the graveyard for free back into play. How this is going to be beneficial for us is we have numerous death triggers among zombies we control in the current 99 of this build. Some of its read whenever this zombie, that whenever a zombie you control dies, each opponent loses one life. So if we can continuously sacrifice through one of our many sacrifice outlets, the Poxwalkers, get them into the graveyard, and then we say cast a zombie from our graveyard from one of our other effects, getting Poxwalkers back into play, we can definitely continue that loop and drain the table in due time. Something a little more quickly and a little less painful for us to do, but more painful for our opponents, is there is a fantastic synergy between this card and Gravecrawler in addition to Phyrexian Altar. We can sacrifice the Gravecrawler to the Phyrexian Altar, getting one black mana in return, sending it to the graveyard. We have another zombie in play, which is Poxwalkers. We use that black mana to cast, Pox, to, to cast Gravecrawler, bringing it back into play. We can vice versa do that with Poxwalkers as long as we have a third zombie on our side of the battlefield, and we can continuously sacrifice to the Phyrexian Altar, draining the board, and as long as our opponents are unable to interact with the Phyrexian Altar or our graveyard, we should have the board, we should have the entire table drained lickety split. So with Poxwalkers and its fantastic synergy with the zombie tribe in and of itself, that's going in, it's going to replace the very selfish and to itself champion of the perished. This was a zombie for one black man that was a 1-1, one, one, and whenever another zombie ETB is under our control, we would put a plus one, plus one counter on this. Now that's all it does. It doesn't help out the team. It doesn't synergize with anything else other than itself and its ability to get bigger and bigger. And we're getting to the point now that the power level for zombies is getting higher and higher. And if that's the case, we need to look to zombies that are going to help synergize and make our other zombies even more powerful. And Poxwalkers offers this, this versatility much more than Champion of the Perished. This is a decision and a swap that's easier than Sunday morning. 
All right, card number two going in. It is, yes, another zombie, but it is the last zombie going into the 99 of this build today. And it is Calculating Lich, a 5-5 zombie wizard with menace for four and two black mana. Whenever a creature attacks one of our opponents, that player loses one life. Note the text on Calculating Lich. It doesn't have to be one of our creatures, and it doesn't have to be just one of our opponent's creatures. All we need to have, all Calculating Lich needs to see, is that a creature attacks an opponent of ours, that player immediately loses one life. Also notice it does not say a non-token creature. Because we have so many spells and effects that create creature tokens, that is going to play into our wheelhouse very, very well. Calculating Lich helps to install a another, I'm sorry, helps to install another potential win condition in this build, and let's face it, it could help incentivize our opponents to attack our other opponents. And also notice that that is a by creature by creature trigger. It's not whenever one or more creatures attacks, it's whenever one creature attacks. So it's creature per trigger, and that is very, very powerful. So with a zombie of such a robust mana value going into the 99, we want to be sure that we target another zombie close to that same CMC so that we don't start skewing our overall CMC average cost too rapidly or too wickedly or too grossly. Or you can add your own adverb here. Just take it in mind that we're trying to keep the mana values around the same. So with a 6 CMC going in, we're going to take out a 5 CMC that, for all intents and purposes, isn't even in the same conversation of power level as Calculating Lich. That is Corpse Harvester, a 3-3 zombie wizard for 3 and 2 black mana. We can tap 1 and a black, tap this, sacrifice a creature, and search our library for a zombie card and a swamp card, and put them both into our hand. Yes, we do eventually get to get a zombie card and a land into our hand by sacrificing most likely one of our zombie tokens, but it is slow. We're paying five mana for this, and its impact is not felt until our next turn. Whereas with Calculating Lich, we pay one more mana, and immediately we have a game-ending threat on our side of the battlefield, particularly if we already have an army massive enough to take advantage of its life-draining ability. So with Corpse Harvester coming out in place of Calculating Lich, let's be honest, those two creatures aren't even allowed to be in the same deck with each other anymore <laughs> unless we can find a better way to squeeze in corpse harvester and if you peruse the current 99 of this build i'm not sure there are any options that are weaker i should say this in a different way i'm sure that every other option in the 99 is more powerful than corpse harvester all right, so we're going to shift our gears away from creatures to some additional spells that are going to help us really, really, you know, um, make our build and make our build much more powerful and synergize so much more with the zombies that we have. So with those stumbling verbal blocks in mind, let's talk about card number three going in. That is Necro Duality. It's an enchantment for three and a blue. And whenever a non-token zombie enters the battlefield under our control, we're going to create a token that's a copy of that creature. So earlier, earlier during this video, you heard me talk about some of the zombies that have death triggers. Well, let's face it, none of those zombies are going to be legends. So if we can get them onto the battlefield, we will make a copy of them, and then we will have two of those death triggers for every one. Necro Duality is also going to do the same thing for all of the lords that are in this deck, as well as some of the other um, zombies that are going to provide different abilities to our squad of the Walking Dead. Necro Duality, in so many ways, is so much better than Reflections of Litjara. That card is not currently in this build, but there are some minor similarities between the two. But Necro Duality just does so much more. Whenever a non-token zombie ETBs, we're getting two of them. And that's all just for the investment of three and one blue mana. We should be able to populate our side of the battlefield with so many zombies not that we couldn't do that before, but Necro Duality, Necro Duality turns that up a notch. 
So with that card coming in, we're going to take out something else, and that's going to be Ghoul's Night Out. Now, this is a sorcery for a hefty three and two black mana that allows us for each player to grab a creature from that player's graveyard. We put those cards onto the battlefield under our control, and they're black zombies in addition to their other colors and types, but they gain Decayed. That Decayed mechanic means that whenever it attacks, we have to sacrifice it at the end of combat. That's a brutal, brutal, brutal way to service a card that could have some fantastic synergies in this deck. However, what we end up having is an overpriced one creature per graveyard recursion spell that, let's face it, if there's a player or two with no creature cards in their graveyards, this becomes even worse. This is so dependent on what's in the graveyards that the CMC of five seems overcosted even if we're sitting at a table with five plus players. With our mana being so important and needing to make you know, impacts throughout the game and not just a one and done effect because let's face it, we're going to get these creatures and at best they serve as blockers or one time attackers. Necro duality is so much more powerful than Ghoul's Night Out that a lot of similarities between the swap with Calculating Lich and Corpse Harvester can apply to this swapping of two cards. All right, next up, another spell. We're going from creature to enchantment, and this time it's an instant. It is Saw in Half, one of the eternal legal cards from Infinity. Here we have an, a removal spell or an improvement spell, if we so choose to use it on one of our own creatures. We'll talk about that in a brief moment. So instant speed, two and a black man, and we get to destroy target creature. Notice it does, doesn't say target creature and opponent controls. If that creature dies this way, its controller creates two tokens that are copies of that creature, except their base power is half that creature's power, and their base toughness is half that creature's toughness, and we round out up each time. So if we destroy a 1-1, one, one, we're going to make two copies that are both 1-1 one, one of that same creature. This is going to be very beneficial for us on the offensive and defensive sides of games. We can, if needed, get rid of an important creature on our opponent's side of the battlefield, but more often than not, I think we're looking to copy, I'm sorry, I think we're looking to target one of our creatures with saw in half. Maybe it's one of the zombies that we talked about earlier with an important death trigger, or maybe it's one of our lords that are providing anthem effects or other abilities. Either way, putting saw in half is a very, putting saw in half in this build gives us a great deal of versatility because we can use it on one of our own creatures for the betterment of our own army, or if needed, we're going to off one of our opponent's creatures most likely during their combat. All right, with Saw and Half going in, we are going to remove a similar instant spell. Well, not really similar, it's just similar in its speed. They're both instant spells. This has a mana value of two and two black. It is Veraska's Contempt. We get to exile target creature or planeswalker, and we gain two life. The exiling effect could be nice, but again, we're playing blue-black, so we have no shortage of removal and disruption spells that are available to us. We have other ways in which to deal with threats that may have indestructible or protection. We have many sacrifice abilities and minus-minus abilities that are in this build. So removing one of our potential exiling cards for something as versatile and powerful as Saw and Hath, that's just going to make the overall scope of this build that much stronger. All right, one more spell to include, and then a couple of updates to the land base, and we're going to call it a day. We went from creatures to an enchantment to an instant, and now it's time for a sorcery. We are going to include a copy of Haunting Voyage. This is a sorcery that we can cast for four and two black mana. And when we do, we get to choose a creature type, and we can return up to two creature cards of that type from our graveyard to the battlefield. Meh. For six mana, we're only getting two creatures. I mean, geez, for our tribal build, Patriarch's Bidding does better than that. 
However, we're not quite done with explaining this card, because if we cast this for its foretell cost, meaning during our turn we can pay two generic mana and exile this card from our hand face down, and then during a later turn we can cast this for one more mana than its original CMC of four and two black by casting it for its foretell cost of five and two black, and if we do that, then we return all creature cards of that type from our graveyards to the battlefield field instead. What we do here is we personalize a Patriarch's bidding by putting a down payment on the generic two mana to foretell it, and then by paying five and two black as opposed to three and two black for the original CMC of Patriarch's bidding, and then we negate our opponent's ability to do the same. Foretelling Haunting Voyage is a fantastic finisher in this deck, particularly if we have the Grey Merchant of Asphalt Fidel lurking around in the graveyard. Can you imagine if Necroduality is on our side of the battlefield as well? That should be an automatic game over. Replacing, I'm sorry, putting in Haunting Voyage and giving us the ability to personalize a Patriarch's bidding is going to help this deck strengthen its already very strong graveyard recursion theme. And with that sorcery going in with a mana value of six, we're going to take out a mana value. Uh, we're going to take out another sorcery with a mana value of six, and this is going to be Zombie Apocalypse. So for the six mana that we're going to lose here, now granted, we're very rarely ever going to cost. I'm very let me say that again. Very rarely are we ever going to cast Haunting Voyage for its 6 CMC because we want to make sure that we can foretell it. Still, it's a 6 for a 6, so we're going to get away with that little bit of a loophole. For Zombie Apocalypse, yes, we were able to return all zombies from our all zombie creatures from our graveyard to the battlefield, but they do return tapped. Having them tapped means that we're leaving ourselves susceptible to our opponents and their potential combats, and we invested six mana to do so. In addition, this also destroys all humans. While we may be able to pop off a couple of stray humans on our opponent's side of the battlefield, believe it or not, we have a number of humans in the 99 of this deck that we do not want to die, and I have had zombie apocalypse in my hand gathering dust many, many times because I did not want to lose the powerful humans that we had on our side of the battlefield at that time. So, Haunting Voyage is going to do better than what Zombie Apocalypse ever could. Alright, five spells in, five spells out, and now we're going to put in a couple of lands to help with updating and upgrading, making the land base a little more powerful, and getting a little more variation so that we can trigger our Field of the Dead a lot more frequently. So, with that, with that in mind, we're going to take out a snow covered island and a snow covered swamp both of which we all both of which we still have numerous copies of in the 99 of this build as well as basic non snow covered islands and non snow covered swamps eventually i don't know how uh, I don't know how reasonable this expectation is, but eventually it would be nice to have a true singleton deck for this build, particularly for the purposes of triggering Field of the Dead every single time that we play a land, which we will anyways as long as we have the requirements met and we have the different land types on our side of the battlefield. That is a lot easier when we're putting down a different land every single time, as opposed to having three swamps and two snow-covered islands on our side of the battlefield, and we draw a Field of the Dead. That's going to hurt in a lot of different ways. Been there, done that, don't want to do it anymore. So we're going to keep making sure that we can single up that land based as best we can. And here, with the snow-covered island coming out, the Shipwreck Marsh is going in. This is going to tap for a blue or a black mana, and it will come into play untapped as long as we control two or more other lands. The Demir Slow Land, as the community has referred to it, the Slow Lands are fantastic in our EDH decks, aren't they, MTGBC? Because let's face it, we're going to have many, many lands on our side of the battlefield. It is Commander, and let's face it, we're going to have that land come into play untapped nearly every time we play it. And the next land going in, this is going to take the place of the snow-covered swamp. 
This is Secluded Courtyard. Now, yes, we do have unclaimed territory still in the 99 of this build, and that's going to stay there for the purposes of providing the colored mana we need. We're not going to remove it because of it becoming obsolete in the presence of Secluded Courtyard for all of the reasons mentioned earlier when we're trying to singleton up this land base. So, Secluded Courtyard has everything that Unclaimed Territory does, but a little bit more. It's going to ETB, we're going to choose a creature type, which is going to be Zombies. It will tap for a colorless mana, but it will also tap for a blue or a black mana that we can only use to cast a creature spell of the chosen type, which will be a zombie creature spell. And at this point, that's everything that Unclaimed Territory can do. In addition to what Secluded Courtyard offers, is that we can also use that mana to activate an ability of a creature card of the chosen type. So that lets us use that mana a little bit more versi versatile, versatile. That allows us to use the mana in a much more versatile way than what Unclaimed Territory currently offers. But again, it's not that far of a leap that we have to remove unclaimed territory from a two-color deck. If you're playing, you know, if you're playing like Sliver Tribal and you have a five-color deck that you're rolling with, you might want to take out the unclaimed territory for Secluded Courtyard just because, let's face it, you don't want to have too many lands in that deck that are going to provide just colorless mana or mana that are specific for your creatures. Here in a two-color deck, I think we could very easily get away with playing Unclaimed Territory and Secluded Courtyard with the backdoor benefit of getting that Field of the Ruin triggered early and often. All right, MTG BC, we have updated and upgraded the Will Health the Rock Cleaver zombie deck. Let me know your thoughts about these revisions in the comment section below. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.